Hello, happy Earth Week, everyone. Welcome. Attendees, if you'd like to put in the chat your name and where you're from, how you're doing today, go ahead and open up the chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen and select panelists and attendees so everyone can see. We love to get an idea of who's here in the room. And we're so happy to spend this time with you here today celebrating Earth Week in California and this exciting piece of legislation, SB 582, which is California's initiative on climate restoration. This bill will contribute to job creation, climate justice, and ecosystem restoration right here in California, establishing us as a global leader in climate. So at the Foundation for Climate Restoration, we are helping to promote restoration as the third component of climate action. Um, typically in the public sphere, conversations have focused on mitigation and adaptation. So mitigation, for example, how do you build higher seawalls? Adaptation, how do we move people out of wildfire prone areas? But we are working tirelessly from the local to state to national to international and UN levels to get restoration onto the agenda, which is the idea of how do we as human beings actually act as a beneficial species that is actively restoring a healthy climate for all creatures on planet Earth and sequestering carbon dioxide out of the air and putting it back down into the ground and into oceans where it belongs. So we are incredibly excited about this bill, 582, which would require the state of California to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to at least 80% below 1990 levels by the year 2030. It would lead a global effort to restore oceanic and atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases to pre-industrial levels. SB 582 would also develop a climate restoration plan for California. And some aspects that I'm particularly excited about is that it includes a just resilience plan driving climate resilience investments in our state's most vulnerable communities in conjunction with local governments, tribes, and community groups in low income and vulnerable communities. This is amazing. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panelists today. California Senator Henry Stern is the introducer of the bill. He's a sixth generation Californian and LA native, and he represents nearly 1 million residents in the 27th Senate District. Senator Stern has chaired the Senate Natural Resources and Water Committee since 2018. He also sits on the Senate's budget, judiciary, environmental quality, elections and constitutional amendments and energy utilities and communications committees. That's a lot of committees. Senator Stern's office has been attacking climate change and increasing renewable energy, preventing wildfires and protecting communities and strengthening our democracy through voter access, fighting misinformation and promoting civics education. He's focused on helping vulnerable populations, including people with disabilities, the elderly, and victims of human trafficking. Welcome, Senator Stern. Well, thank you, Sandra, and to the whole foundation for not just putting the event together this morning, but for, for your thought leadership and for pushing all of us in public policy making and in climate policy to expand our imagination of what's morally necessary. Um, you know, I've been working in climate policy throughout my early career, basically, you know, since the beginning. Um, I was a young lawyer working at the Energy and Commerce Committee back in 2009 when all things felt possible. And the Waxman-Markey bill, I was working for Congressman Waxman at the time. And, you know, we thought we'd save the whole world back then. Um, turns out, there's a little more work to do. Um, and that moment, that, that moment of progress uh, passed. And, you know, we've, I think, regressed over the last four years um, and maybe lowered our sights and maybe found ourselves in a place where you, you sort of just want to, um, you know, limp through this thing and do what we can. But, but there's a subtle, risk i think of an admission of defeat in our in our grand mission to make this planet livable that i i don't think is is true to california's dna and it's frankly um 
you know, morally, it's, it's just an unacceptable position to be in. And I was, I was taken by the notion of restoration because of its roots in, in the justice conversation. You know, there's, there's one approach to, to solving problems that it involves sort of getting back to some form, some form of retribution or, or some form of, of, of relieving a debt for a single incident. And mitigating our emissions is completely necessary. And without an aggressive mitigation plan, um, we will be in trouble, but we also will miss a ton of economic opportunity and we'll get out mitigated by the rest of the world who's gonna go faster and gonna make more electric cars and gonna out solar us. And um, there, is a, there is a clean energy race going on in this country. So that first one, that first element of the bill, yes, yeah, is, is all about the emergency, but there's a bigger piece here too. Yeah, it's a win, 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 win all the way around. That's it. <laughs> awesome, we're excited to get into the content of the bill. And next, I'm going to introduce California Senator Dave Cortesi. Welcome, Senator Cortesi. He's a principal co-author of the bill and represents District 15, which encompasses Santa Clara County in Silicon Valley. Senator Cortesi previously served on the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors for over a decade, with four years as board president on the San Jose City Council, eight years and two years as a vice mayor. He led Santa Clara County to transition to 100% renewable energy electric power, creating the County Climate Commission in partnership with Al Gore's Climate Reality Project, and helped form Silicon Valley Clean Energy, the community-owned provider of carbon-free electricity for Silicon Valley. In 2019, Senator Cortez led the effort for the first County Climate Restoration Emergency Resolution in the nation, approved in Santa Clara. That year, he was honored to be the only elected official to address the first annual Climate Restoration Forum at the UN Nations headquarters in New York City. Thank you for your leadership on this issue, Senator Cortesi. Well, thank you, Sandra, for um, that introduction. I appreciate it very much. Um, but the next most immediate thanks is to Senator Stern because um, I'm here uh, because he's collaborative, because he's a leader uh, among leaders in the Senate um, on climate policy. Um, and uh, when we talked about this bill, uh, frankly, he invited me to be a principal co-author. And, um, and of course, given my background and, and my focus, um, I jumped at the opportunity. I'm a, I'm a freshman senator, and uh, I will tell you, I have been impressed and amazed at the resolve um, in our in our caucus, particularly uh, among those um, who uh, you hear speaking publicly as being committed to these issues, uh, we get to hear folks um, speak in, in, in caucuses and in, in discussions and in informal groups uh, with the same resolve and the same commitment to overcome you know, the barriers and obstacles uh, that we need to overcome you know, to keep moving forward. Um, I don't wanna talk about my past or some of the things I was involved with in a dozen years, uh, particularly leading up to uh, this year when I joined the State Senate, you've touched upon some of those um, by way of background and I appreciate that very much. Um, but uh, I, I intend to continue to uh, work in close partnership with Senator Stern, um, you know, as we, we continue to, to try to uh, guide uh, the entire legislature in, um, complement the efforts of the governor, you know, in this in this space. Thank you. It's so good to see this leadership happening at the state and the national level right now. It's really forward looking. From the private sector, we welcome Dr. Brent Constance, the CEO and founder of Blue Planet Systems Corporation. Dr. Constance is an expert in biomineralization. And over the past 25 years, as founder and CEO has led three medical device companies to advance mineralization technologies for orthopedic bone cements. Dr. Constance founded carbon sequestration company Caldera to address global climate concerns with the goal of permanently removing gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the form of carbonate minerals. Blue Planet is the next generation product using these carbonate materials. Welcome Dr. Constance. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. <clears throat> you know, C California is in a unique spot to be a, a world leader. This is really ground zero for 
showing people how this actually works. So taking the legislation and translating it into something real that we can actually translate to what's gonna, how it's going to contribute to climate restoration and how it's gonna get there. And we're in a unique position as a state. If we were a country, we'd be a significant country in the world and we can implement these legislations. And we have to be aggressive because we are the leader. We're leading the way, we're leading the way for India, for Saudi Arabia, for Japan, for the whole world in, in, our, in these legislations. And the next step is to pick it up and translate it to actual practice to the degree that it has a significant impact. And, and that's what I hope to talk about more today. Thank you. Eighth largest economy in the world. Hey, the world's counting on us. And from fifth now, wow. We're up in five. <laughs> Moving we're on up. India, past uh, Germany, yeah, so we're at five right now. Ooh, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely in a place for leadership. And from civil society, we welcome Dr. Erica Dodds, our very own COO here at the Foundation for Climate Restoration. The foundation is a nonprofit committed to removing excess carbon from our atmosphere. Dr. Dodds is an eco-anxiety and environmental expert. She is presented at the UN headquarters and multiple different youth climate convenings across the country. Her lifelong interest in poverty reduction led her to study abroad in West Africa, intern with an NGO in rural India, and work for the Evaluation Office of the International Labor Organization in Geneva. Welcome, Dr. Dodds. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here with this exceptional panel. And I thank you for the, the opening remarks and to uh, Senator Stern and Senator Cortez for your work on, uh, on uh, SB 582. The Foundation for Climate Restoration was born out of the question, what is the future that we want for our climate? In retrospect, it seems really obvious that what we want is a climate that we know that humanity and future generations in our natural world can flourish in. But actually that was not an obvious thing before this goal was created. When we started working on climate restoration, we thought that you know if only the solutions were, were available, then climate restoration would be a done deal. But when we started looking around, we found that there are promising solutions like the one that, that Brent is working on. And yet climate restoration is still not uh, on track yet. And so we adopted an ecosystem approach where we're working with stakeholders in all relevant sectors to ensure that not just the solutions exist, but that the environment exists that will allow them to thrive. And a key part of that ecosystem is the policy, support a policy that will allow for solutions to take off and allow for civil society to engage meaningfully in the, in the development of uh, climate restoration agendas. So thank you again to the senators. Thank you to Brent for your amazing work. Thanks to Sandra for, for moderating and for the incredible work you do as well. Thank you, Dr. Dodds. And a little bit about me, your moderator. My name is Sandra Kwok. I'm the CEO and founder of a benefit corporation called Ten Power. We're working on providing renewable energy internationally to people on the planet who don't have access to electricity today. So let's dive into this bill. Senator Stern and Cortezzi, can you tell us a little bit about the bill, what it contains, how it came to be, and who supports it? What inspired you to write it? Well, I, I'll, I'll kick off and then I'll pass it over to Senator Cortese, who may be a freshman in the Senate, but is certainly not a freshman when it comes to policy leadership, his experience in actually implementing resilience and mitigation on the ground is really the, going to be the, the key missing piece, I think, in our state's efforts. But the bill is a three part bill. So the emergency climate mitigation piece is gonna double the state's commitments to carbon reduction over this decade. We truly believe that between, you know, over these next eight, nine years, these will be the formative years. Um, and that we can't put off all our major emissions reductions to 2035 and 2045. Um, but we also don't wanna pull up short and even stop at neutrality. So. We, we, we set up in the second piece, a climate restoration framework for the first time ever in California that would give the Secretary of Natural Resources actually a bigger role who oversees both 
our natural landscapes and ocean protection and all of our agriculture, as well as our oil and gas sector and the extractive industries. So that looking at California as a potential sink for carbon emissions, when right largest sources on the planet, whether it's the amount we drive or the amount of forests that burn or the amount of oil we extract, we are both a huge producer of pollution as well as a, a clean energy solver. So the second piece would set out a restoration framework and require us to go beyond neutrality and beyond even net negativity all the way to pre-industrial levels uh, by 2050, which is an incredibly ambitious target if you, if you really get down and, and dig into details. Um, and then the third piece is, a, is what we call a just resilience framework to, to really put vulnerability to climate change at the centerpiece of the state spending strategy. So for, for the folks living in Senator uh, Cortese's backyard who might be going through an extreme heat event, uh, who are elderly and maybe don't have access to the proper air conditioning or live right next to a floodplain or in my area, you know, live right next to the edge of a wildfire risk. Those most vulnerable people we believe should be met first by um, a massive investment in climate infrastructure. And so this just resilience framework would, would hopefully bring some of that equity back to the, to the promise we've made and not just have um, those who can afford to adapt uh, be first in line. Climate justice now. Senator Cortese, as a longstanding champion of climate restoration, how has your experience with this type of legislation shaped the way that you've approached this bill? Well, you know, um, net negative, um, you know, the elements that Senator Stern just mentioned in this bill are, you know, for now are everything we know about where we need to go. And I actually think his, you know, drafting of this bill, which of course didn't occur yesterday, it occurred, um, you know, months ago, um, weeks and months ago, you know, was in, in some sense prescient in terms of keeping California out in front and aligning us with anticipated federal policy, which of course, you know, really just started to break this week in terms of what the Biden administration is doing. So it's, you know, it's that prescience is, you know, and that understanding of, of what's coming next and what's right around the corner is, you know, why Senator Stern was one of my first calls uh, when I got to the legislature and I haven't stopped calling him since. But Yes, I have this background in climate uh, restoration. You talked in my introduction about, you know, bringing this emergency declaration uh, first to Santa Clara County, and then we expanded it and have been expanding it to local governments all over the country um, to get people to understand that this has to be about pre restoration of pre-industrial levels. It, it has to be um, about removal. It, it, it can't, the standard can't be any less than that. And of course this bill, um, embodies that, uh, you know, very much so. Um, and then I think the other thing you learn in local government, which does translate to state government is, you know, we, we have a bureaucracy, you know, we have uh, regulators, we have um, implementers that aren't us. And if, if you, when you do this, and I, I know there are people out there who will say, oh, is this you know, just a planning thing? Um, it is critical to, ha to have this legislation um, chart the course uh, for those, um, you know, excuse the term, but in the bureaucracies, in the administration, in the regulatory agencies, and they, when they see this, um, they, they have to pay attention and know that this is the course that's been charted for them, uh, regardless of, of what legislation comes next, and, and regardless of, of what obstacles there are politically uh, to getting uh, work done. Uh, I think we all know <laughs> that there's opposition to these policies out there. So uh, it does all of that. And I think all of that, you know, um, in terms of my support, my willingness and desire to, to be a co-author of this bill was informed by my experience of local government where you run into those same kinds of issues. Speaking of bureaucracy and pushback, what type of support or barriers are y'all seeing to this bill? Do you think that SB 582 will pass? I, I do. Um, I, I think it will pass if, if we find a willingness from folks who don't normally get together on the same kind of issue. Um, 
it's a big enough vision that I think we have a chance for an unlikely coalition here. You know, there's been an ongoing tension between sort of frontline environmental justice communities who are dealing with the, the ravages both of climate and then pollution in general in their backyards who want to see big changes. And that the, on the other hand, uh, in, in organized labor and basically in, in the employment sector, especially in the fossil fuel industry, there's been a lot of discomfort um, that if California shuts down all these industries that we'll put ourselves at a competitive disadvantage and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll put people out of work. I think what we're trying to show here, and, and if we get it right, I think the bill w could pass and um, could impact not just the national dialogue, but hopefully Glasgow and the whole world trajectory. Um, by pairing aggressive mitigation with a carbon removal and restoration framework, we're pushing both those together and saying it's not either or. We're not going to offset our way to the future. We're not going to to sacrifice frontline communities, you know, pollution standards and say, no, no, you just got to eat more pollution in, in your backyard while we go figure out this broad, you know, esoteric carbon math. It's saying we're going to take care of you, but at the same time, we've got to be a little bit brave and push the envelope. And and you know, companies like like Brent's, you know, experimenting in, in technology and really going first in the doing part, that's what that restoration framework allows us to do. So it's been interesting. There is no, um, no opposition at this point from organized labor. And the environmental justice community is also not yet fully uh, invested because there's some nervousness. Things like carbon capture and storage in oil fields, those kinds of questions are still looming. But I, we're, we're committed to this broader diplomatic effort. I think if we can solve that, I, you know, anything is possible. Yeah, workforce support, super important piece of this. And we'll get into that in a moment um, with Blue Planet. On, on the topic of carbon offsets, how do we ensure that climate restoration in the short term doesn't incentivize a longer tail on oil production? When I saw there was just a... Uh, a comment also in the, your chat about uh, fracking permits approved by the governor. I think, you know, we had a, a, a pretty controversial and important piece of legislation in our committee that, that took a very different approach, right? Didn't take a carbon or an emissions-based approach to extraction, but just said, we need to shut down this industry essentially by a certain date. I think the governor himself is going to, is poised to make um, some pretty uh, bold announcements soon. Um, on that front and had committed himself to going after the ban on fracking. Uh, but I think the, in terms of the long tail concern and, and overextending the life of, of fossil fuel assets, I, I, I really, I think the more interesting question is what to do with those assets and what to do with, you know, our gas pipeline system or, you know, 10,000 underground injection control wells in the state or geology that truly, you know, was built on oil, but could lend itself to, to other forms of, of permanent carbon storage. So I, um, I don't think it's, it's so much about, you know, picking an industry and trying to extend their business model, but instead um, changing the business model altogether. I want to see Chevron become a different company. And I know one state, you know, it happens to be their home state, but I, I think changing those kinds of corporations and getting them to be forward thinking and become carbon managers, not producers, that shift will change the whole world. So we'll see. We've got a bit of a fulcrum here. Mm -hmm. Utilizing all the levers. Senator Cortezzi, are there other bills on the docket right now that our audience should be aware of that are pushing climate restoration progress? You know, there, there are a number of them. I have um, a decarbonization, so-called decarbonization package myself, three bills I introduced um, on my swearing in day, December 7th, and we've worked through, through with a lot of help, you know, from um, our own, my own coalition, um, our own caucus. Um, you know, we've, we've been able to continue to advance those despite opposition, frankly. Um, but there's, there's, there are a lot. <laughs> and of course, you know, the, 
the effort, the climate effort, the climate restoration effort is, is segmented a little bit in terms of the way legislation comes, right? It comes a little bit more by micro issue area necessarily. I mean, it's pretty hard to write a bill that would cover everything that we need to do. And if you did, it probably would go nowhere because you would attract, you know, such, um, uh, you know, piecemeal opposition in every single sector that you were trying to you know, deal with that it would, it would appear everyone was against you. So there's kind of a, an art to all that. I do want to say on the workforce issue very quickly, I know you're going to get into that more. Um, Senator Stern himself, you know, has um, legislation that, that, you know, attempts to go into workforce and start allaying some concerns. We need to do that a lot more uh, both, and I would include corporate transition, which uh, Senator Stern was just talking about. And, and let me put it this way. It's easy enough in polarized politics to say, well, those guys are against us or they keep coming against us. But you got to stop for a minute, I think, and say, why is that? And what are we doing to address that? And what are we doing to take away that problem? And I think because the climate crisis is an emergency, uh, is a crisis. We've moved quickly and with detail on a number of pieces of legislation, um, and we continue to do that. I think the environmental community, per se, is really thrilled to see that, but we've yet to catch up and, and apply the same kind of deep dive and detail um, and focus on corporate and workforce transition. And that's and that's that's the just part, right? Um, it, it it can't just say, hey, let's just roll these folks, the opposition, and keep moving when they have an absolute legitimate concern that we should all be concerned about because, you know, yay, we win the climate battle, which is first and foremost, but then if we end up with a residual problem of destruction of our, our, our underlying workforce, which is a humanitarian problem as well, uh, not so good. So we, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, absolutely. Declaring a climate emergency front and center, but also making sure that everybody is on board with that. And moving into workforce development, let's hear from Dr. Brent Constanz as a voice from the private sector about job creating opportunities in climate restoration. Brent, where do you see the biggest opportunities for the private sector to contribute to climate restoration? And how can we raise awareness among key stakeholders around these opportunities? Well, I, I think it's primarily <clears throat> within infrastructure, you know, and, and as a state, we, uh, you know, we consume about 240 million tons of rock every year. We import a lot of it from British Columbia and other places. And, uh, you know, there's the potential in that 240 million tons of rock that the state's procuring every year to sequester and permanently uh, over 100 million tons of CO2 a year, you know, and the state's putting out a total of about 400 million tons. So if we work at it from that perspective and say, okay, we've reset the, the goal for the target for climate restoration for CO2 removal, it's actually within the numbers that can actually set goals locally. For example, the city and county of San Francisco can say, okay, now that we understand what the statewide goal is for uh, climate restoration over the next decade or so, we can go through the individual departments in the city and say, let's go to SFO. That's a, a department of the city and county of San Francisco where we're already pouring concrete, which is carbon negative. How, how's, how's that department gonna contribute? And then how are all these different departments gonna contribute? And if you look at the low carbon hub that we're building, with San Francisco Bay aggregates up in Pittsburgh, California now. When you look at the job creation that is gonna come with that, it's, uh, it's, it's really amazing how that flows through the infrastructure all through the whole food chain. By, but it started with setting that goal, resetting the goal for the state. So instead of buying our rock from British Columbia and having it transported down here, now we're making the, the rock in the state of California with California jobs and we're lowering our reliance on foreign aggregate, which is a big commodity in, the, in California and, and creating these long-term permanent high paying jobs at, at a low carbon hub in, on the Bay in California. And it's furthermore uh, setting new standards like the Carbon Star standard, which is being practiced now in the city and county of San Francisco in their specification of the concrete for these massive infrastructure projects 
is is a, another way that for, through legislation that we can drive this and create a pull to create all these jobs in these new industries in California to make California where we're storing the carbon, not where we're creating it. Incredible. And I want everybody in the audience to know that Blue Planet's carbon negative harvesting concrete is part of SFO's Terminal 2. So this is real. It's happening. It's such a big deal. Friend, I've heard some really exciting things about Blue Planet and Habitat for Humanity. Can you speak a little bit more about how climate restoration is creating a just transition for disadvantaged populations in addition to creating high paying jobs? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you look at where all the CO2 is created, it, uh, you know, <laughs> it tends to be in disadvantaged communities. If you, if you draw a map of the local CO2 concentrations, uh, it's not 400 everywhere in the world, just like it is at the top of Mauna Loa. It actually varies a lot. And if you, if you go into, even the ocean is more acidic uh, near these large CO2 emitters by, by as much as double. If you're walking through parts of San Francisco in the four in the afternoon, it may be 800 parts per million, twice that of what we think it is. So we don't understand this. We don't perceive it on a daily basis, but just if you map CO2 levels in under advantaged communities, they, it's, there's a, a very strong correlation. And, actually going into these places and capturing that CO2 because it even though it can it's a long-lived molecule and it can go all around the earth it actually lingers for a while and takes a while to diffuse out and um, we have the ability to go into these urban centers someone called it an urban quarry <laughs> if you will where you're you're quarrying carbon dioxide in the urban centers where it's concentrating along with many other pollutants as you know and uh, actually now we're gonna quarry it from the air internally and create it into the same infrastructure projects and become part of the circular economy within the urban landscape. Oh, I think that's a really beautiful metaphor. And I love the metaphor of you working on the human body and now working on the body that is our ecosystem. It seems so obvious that all of our buildings should be made of this material. It's, it's just a closed loop. So what are the biggest challenges to scaling up solutions like yours? Uh, it's really the size of the problem because we're faced with something you could actually address most of the problem with. And there are very few levers that actually can be taken to, you know, tens of gigaton levels. And we have to understand there's over 55 gigatons of rock mined every year. And most of that rock is the type of rock which is made from CO2. It's called limestone. You know, the Great Barrier Reef, the White Cliffs of Dover. Those structures are, are mainly 40% CO2, but we're talking gigaton levels. And that's why I say California is really the leader here. Those 240 million tons is a significant percent of the 50 gigatons that are mined worldwide. So it's, we, we have the opportunity today by making our infrastructure projects like at SFO out of carbon sequestered rock uh, a real example where people can actually extrapolate to the global problem. With many of our fantastic solutions, we can't go from something we can do in the state of California and show how that's going to really spread around the earth. But rock's different. Every country, every city, every place humans live in the world are, are producing and mining and transporting rock, and they have everything. So from the smallest village to the largest urban center in the world, we can demonstrate how we can actually tackle this. We got this. I always like to say it's not a technology problem. We have the solutions. It's a, it's a people problem. Right? And turning to the people and civil society, Dr. Erica Dodds, we'd love to hear your perspective on representing the nonprofit sector in collaboration across many other sectors as well. The Foundation for Climate Restoration takes an ecosystem approach to climate restoration. So what exactly does that mean, especially in context of bills like SB 582? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we bring stakeholders together across many sectors to work together on climate restoration. And one of the things that we hear all the time is, what can I do? Where can I see this being done? So having leadership like SB 582 as a model for, for other uh, government entities and also for other citizen advocates is really a helpful thing to have. There are other policies 
uh, around the across the country, I guess, that are being introduced that work on different parts of climate restoration. I think uh, Senator Cortez's climate emergency, uh, climate restoration emergency resolution was a good example of that. Um, but there are others that are working on procurement, you know, working on ensuring that low carbon building materials are being used. And the more that these things can get introduced, the more they can be replicated elsewhere. But they don't get replicated if people don't know about them. So we're really focused on, you know, staying, keeping our finger on the pulse of what's being done, helping educate the general public about why this is important and, and what, what's available and what they can do. And then helping them communicate as well to uh, to green organizations, to their local government, and uh, even to corporations, so that everyone is really on the same page with this goal. Beautiful. And can you speak a little bit more about the role of legislation in advancing climate restoration? Yeah, definitely. I think Brent did an excellent job of outlining the the scalability of a solution like mineralizing CO two. And there are, there are so many solutions being developed right now. And I think uh, partners like our partners at XPRIZE with their new uh, carbon removal XPRIZE, they've done a good job of helping focus the carbon tech industry on scalable, durable solutions that can make a, a real measurable impact. Without legislation though, it's really hard to get any of these things implemented at a meaningful scale. So procurement legislation, as I mentioned, is one of those levers that can be really effective and doesn't need to be extraordinarily hard to implement. And resolutions as well that just declare we're committed to restoring the climate and to ensuring that those most vulnerable are kept safe and are included in the, you know, at the decision making table really helps align the, the policy and the public on the goal of restoring the climate. And what can we do as the public to help get climate restoration policy more widely adopted at the local, state, and national level? Well, one thing that anyone is welcome to do is join the Foundation for Climate Restoration's new local chapters program. We have 15 chapters on four continents at this point, and we're looking to expand. One of the purposes of this program is to help educate chapter members about what legislation is available and how they can work with their local uh, policymakers to get things implemented. Another thing, of course, is just calling your policymaker or uh, writing letters to the editor or op-eds in support of legislation like this. Thank you so much. We're going to do a lightning round in reverse order. So we'll start with you, Dr. Dodds. And same question to everybody, just a quick word or phrase. What is one thing that audience members can do right now to support climate restoration and the various initiatives that we've discussed today, like SB 582? Dr. Dodds. Uh, people can, I like to tell my local chapter members, one of your jobs is to be a loud mouth. Just talk to everyone in your life about climate restoration until you get tired of it, which you won't because it's so much fun. Dr. Constance. Oh, you're on mute. Procurement. All right, short and sweet. Senator Cortezzi. You're on mute too. Zoom life. Keep bringing the case, uh, not only to state capitals and provincial capitals uh, around the world. I know we have people here um, outside of the United States, but I've said this before, and I've certainly said this at, at convenings um, uh, of, the, of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Some of this work has to be one, done one town at a time, one city at a time, one county at a time. Um, and it is really important to uh, activate grassroots activation, show up, um, excuse the phrase, throw down <laughs> at your local city hall um, and do that at the Capitol as soon as we get open. We could use to see you there, right, Senator Stern? It gets a little lonely sometimes, but, uh, but you know, that, that phone call in the hearing really helps, you know? So if you make that one phone call even if it feels like you're just one voice on a, you know, on a big long list, if you call in from, you know, pick your town and your senator isn't yet on board with the bill and they hear a familiar voice, it's going to affect the conversation. So writing 
letters and making those phone calls and advocating right now to help us move Senate Bill 582 and help us get it out of the Senate would be huge. There's so much else to do. And if your city council is in sight, like, and you know your mayor, them weighing in to help. So you can advocate on your own behalf or get your local government engaged. The power. Awesome. Thank you so much, all of you. We're going to hand it over to Hilda to read off some questions from the chat. And if um, any of the participants have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A section. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for submitting your great question. The first question um, here is for the senators, and it is from Francis. It is, given the focus on upgrading infrastructure and, and mitigation measures, does the bill require that new infrastructure be built with carbon sequestering, sequestering, excuse me, or at least carbon neutral materials? You may take this one, Senator. Yeah, yeah Senator, uh, I can add on a little bit probably, but it, well, go ahead, please lead. It's, it's, uh, it's a little more high level than that. There is, there is actually another piece of legislation that um, former assembly member Bonta now officially confirmed attorney general Bonta on buying clean and doing some of those procurement mandates around um, carbon neutral materials and specifically in cement. But this bill is a bit more of the overarching framework to say, you know, we've got to remove gigatons and that buildings will be a critical part of it, but it doesn't sort of reach down into the building code itself. But I know Senator Cortese is reaching deeper into the building code on a lot of his work. So he's going to have something to say about that. Yeah, it is um, building materials, um, you know, are, are a next step that has to be done legislatively very, very soon. Um, what this bill does, I think, and I was trying to say that at the outset, um, amongst other things, is, is it really establishes, by, by firmly establishing where we need to go, it, it essentially gives us <laughs> cover in a sense when we come in with those building materials, pieces of legislation, and people say, why the heck do you have to have this? We come right back to 582 and say, because that's the only way we're gonna meet these goals, if that makes sense. Um, but secondly, let me just say, um, similar to corporate transition and workforce transition, you know, we don't really have the metrics. We, we are not a planned economy. And I think most Americans are happy with that. You know, we, we don't know exactly what happens when you mandate procurement overnight um, to housing production, to uh, workforce uh, impact and so forth. If we did, it would be really easy to do the kind of work we've been doing in the pandemic with early action, where we say, give these folks paid sick leave. And the flip side of that is give, uh, you know, the employers a tax credit to offset what that's gonna cost. We don't have those offsets yet. And we, we need to get there and we need to get there in a hurry. And um, I, I happen to chair the labor committee in the Senate. Um, another reason that Senator Stern and I will probably be working together a lot on these kinds of issues. Um, because we have to get there. Great, great. Thank you to both senators. I have another question. Um, this one came in from Julia and it is also for both senators here. Under resilience, do you collaborate with other states in developing strategies? For example, the city of Phoenix is working on heart readiness, focusing on shade structures. probably don't collaborate enough. I mean, there's, I work, I'm on the board of the National Conference of, of um, State Legislators the, for, that are focused on the environment. So it's called NCEL. So it's a, a national coalition of other state legislators. And we've got about six or seven bills in different states moving. None as ambitious as this. Frankly, California is a fair bit ahead of, of most other states in the country when it comes to carbon targets, but the, the, the municipal level actions and the, the conference of mayors and the C40 initiative and the, the resilient cities initiative, those, those sort of sharing across building codes and using that technical work, there's so much value in that. We, we've, we've told our resources board, for instance, even to share some of our technical data, even with their counterparts in China of how to set up you know, carbon management programs. So there's a MOU, for instance, between the state um, university systems and Xinhua University. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, 
uh, our politics aren't necessarily the politics of Ohio or Michigan or West Virginia. So sometimes it's also, we got to be a little bit modest in California. If we try to be know-it-alls and act morally perfect, um, you know, it, it'll grate on folks. So sometimes it's like, you know, walking softly and carrying a big policy. Great, thank you, Senator Stern. All right, um, this question came, uh, is for Brent. It is from Robert Seaton Todd. And um, actually, yep, is there any specific CDR scheduled? For example, the Livermore getting to neutral report that has been legislated or is it left to the sectors of NR and AEP to make these determinations? Um, I think the, the biggest thing happening right now uh, is this issuance of the Carbon Star system. It's analogous to Energy Star, but rather for energy efficiency, it's for carbon intensity of building materials. And this will uh, then be translated to a, a ISO international standard. But for example, uh, the city and county of San Francisco have a five-year plan where they use the carbon star rating to specify the concrete they'll be pouring there for the next five years. And um, for instance, they provide a minimum requirement of a carbon footprint of 200 pounds of CO2 per cubic yard of concrete going all the way through carbon neutral to a, 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 a exceptional project goal of negative 200 pounds CO2 per cubic yard of concrete. And I think, I think this standard is, uh, is gonna probably be highly adopted over many other systems that are in place because it can be applied to every uh, yard of concrete, uh, which, which is different in every case. And, and it's already gone in international and been acknowledged and is being used in specifications at this time. And one, if I could add, Hilda, just to put a fine point at the state level, we have an executive order that reaches for carbon neutrality uh, by 2050 uh, for, that came from the last governor, Jerry Brown. But executive orders don't only have as much force as the law gives them. So that's why we're moving this legislation. Um, there is currently no nothing in our statutes or on the books that say that, that push towards carbon removal, that push towards restoration. We have a lot on mitigation, but nothing yet on the books of California law in this, in this new frontier. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, one more question for Brent. When will individuals be able to buy synthetic limestone? Um, well, the, the purchasers are, are the concrete producers. Um, and uh, the, uh, the current plant uh, is being built in Pittsburgh, California. It will be scaling up over the next few years. The, the projects themselves are spoken for by large users like the airport at this time. But I believe in, by 2024, 2025, there may even be a SAC product that's available, you know, just like SAC concrete. So you can do carbon negative at home if you want. Great, thank you. Um, all right, this next question um, is from Toby. Is there California registration that mandates any specific CDR schedule or does the bill leave that to agencies to determine? That one's for the senators. Um, the, this, the most micromanagement we do of the schedule for carbon dioxide removal is the net negative emissions target by 2035. Um, we do not, however, um, describe, for instance, what sectors should go first right now. There's a lot of discretion left to the Secretary of Natural Resources and the California Air Resources Board to kind of do some of the nitty gritty work on also defining a durable framework and establishing what makes carbon removal permanent you know, will there need to be a larger insurance or trust fund in the case of, of, of unauthorized releases? Because when you work in natural systems, they don't always behave as, as much as the concrete that, 
that Brent works on. So even if you do the work on regenerative agriculture, but then a, a new farmer buys that land and tills all the soil and you lose all your carbon benefit, how do we account for that potential for loss? We're not right now sort of in the weeds of those details, but we are saying, you know, 80% by 2030, then we want full net negative by 35, and then to hit, you know, try to hit full restoration uh, by mid-century. So that's as, that's as micromanagey as we get at this point. Great, thank you. Okay, this question came a little earlier today. Um, so this is from Big Comfer. What is the vision of workforce transition and change of industry goals with fossil fuel industries? Well, that's, um, that's a question of, of, uh, <laughs> of the moment, really. Um, you know, if you heard, I think some of our other comments previously, um, I think everyone on the panel has acknowledged uh, the, the challenge and the need and the need for detail and the need for beyond a vision, the need for actual metrics so that we uh, can respond to people with, with science. We're lawmakers in, in our jobs, the Senator and I, and, and when, when you're making law, um, as finite as, as we can do that, as defined as we can do that with bills like SB 582 um, or some of the bills I'm carrying, 30, 31, and 32, people rightfully expect you to come back with an equivalent level of detail um, on, on the workforce transition side. So I think the vision is, the vision is, you know, don't worry, the green jobs will come. Don't worry, it'll actually be higher quality jobs, uh, well, the wages will come, um, but that's not enough um, to, to satisfy the very constituents in the workforce that we represent as constituents um, in, in the people that represent them. So we need to take a deeper dive and it will hold up uh, even the most basic legislation, like some of the things that have been asked about, have you set specific standards? Have, have you identified uh, you know, building materials, for example, as as critical as a critical next step. Um, yes, we've identified that at the vision level. Uh, when you try to put that in legislation, for example, my uh, SB 31, which Senator Stern is very familiar with, all we were trying to do with that bill, and we're still doing it, thank God it got out of committee, but is to say that uh, grants um, that support folks, including in residential homes who are trying to decarbonize, uh, I'm sorry, who are trying to reduce uh, emissions in their own homes, uh, need to include decarbonization. They should include building materials, right? They should, that should be an allowed expense. Right now, at this moment in the state of California, that's not an allowed expense under CEC grants. You, you can't uh, say, well, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to go electrification in my house. Can I have the grant? No. Um, not for that, or I'd like to um, do an add-on to my house and I'd like to use uh, carbon negative building materials. Um, they're going to say, well, that, that doesn't qualify. So, you know, we, <laughs> we're trying to break through at that most fund fundamental level right now. So far, so good. But as we said earlier, we need, all, we need your support as well. And Hilda, if I could just add, I know they had asked sort of the, if they thought if another person asked on this same note on labor and some of those tensions, whether they think some of the national support for the, the American jobs plan from the organized labor community could help. And I would say, heck yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the president has, has led on this issue exactly the right way. They have been pitch perfect in rolling out jobs first strategy, not a climate and then, oh, we'll figure out what happens to your job later, that those are interlinked. And so, for example, there's a $16 billion element of the American Jobs Plan that's just about closing all the abandoned oil wells in the country. And who do you need to do that? Oil workers. Turns out we could actually create thousands of jobs in California closing wells that nobody's using but are leaking into the community's groundwater or polluting their air with benzene. We have 3,700 abandoned wells in California and a lot of others that are idle that could be abandoned. Let's go have a green stimulus in the oil and gas sector by, by closing those wells, locking that carbon in and using those pipe fitters expertise, honoring their work, right? Not saying, go find a different job. No, no, do your job. 
and do it well. We need you to do it, but to make us safer, not to keep doing the old stuff. That, that's great. Thank you both. All right. And this might be the last question for today. And thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Um, the last question for right now will be, do you have strategies for helping to intensify, intensi oh my goodness, incentivize local community members to participate and initiate climate actions by paying them with carbon credits or tokens of some sort? So I certainly don't have a bill like that yet, but it's a, a, a good idea. And maybe Senator Stern's aware of uh, something that's um, on the front burner, but um, you know, anything we can do to, uh, as I said, one, one town at a time, one city at a time, one county at a time, and, and to not lose sight, despite the wonderful work that, in my opinion, that the Biden administration is doing, as Senator Stern said, despite the, the efforts, the battles we're fighting in the Capitol, um, you know, we, we need folks engaged. So, um, you know, anything we can do to incentivize that, I think is, is a good thing and something I, I would support. And I, and I would just add, um, you currently, if you're a customer of a PG&E or SCE or SDG&E, you do annually get a climate credit on your bill. Um, that is um, a direct uh, cash reduction in your bill um, that comes from the utilities uh, carbon allowances. So it reduces pollution, but it also gives you money back. But you also now, because of what we, we have called the low carbon fuel standard, the electricity being produced for fuel into new electric and older electric cars, you can now get a $1,500 rebate on an electric car um, through that carbon program. So it's a different kind of credit. It's not you can spend on anything you want, but you're going to get, in addition to federal tax credit and the state rebate, the utilities themselves, and this is SMUD and PG&E and SCE and a whole bunch of others, you get 1500 bucks off just right off the top on the hood. So you know, there's, there's, there's tools. We can, we can keep doing more. You can, you know, the swapping out your furnace or if your water heater breaks, you can get 500 bucks off if you want to go electric with that. So a lot's out there. Um, so we're happy to help you hunt. It's been such a generative and enlightening conversation. We're going to let the senators get back to lawmaking before we wrap up. Thank you so much, senators, for joining us today and for all of the incredible work that you're doing for California and for the planet. Really an honor to have you here today. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you, Sandra and, and Erica, Brent, Hilda, everybody. And tune in on Tuesday. Please call in. The info's in the chat. We want to hear from you. So Tuesday morning, make your voice heard. Climate Tuesday, Earth Day every day. <laughs> the Foundation for Climate Restoration is honored to be pushing for important legislation like SB 582 and hosting educational events and showcasing solutions. Just like today, we invite all of you to join us. We really appreciate your support, your participation, as well as your donations. And we currently have a match of up to $50,000 from a generous donor. So any donations you make today will be matched towards that amount. Please check out the link that we're gonna put in the chat here. And um, we would really appreciate an ongoing monthly contribution. Grab some swag while you're on our website. Mother's Day is coming up, Father's Day is coming up. All of you are just so beautiful. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your continued dedication to creating a thriving and just world for all. Let's make every day Earth Day. Thank you, Dr. Brent and Dr. Erica for sharing your wisdom today. And we will see all of you at the next Foundation for Climate Restoration event. Thank you very much.